I wanna pray and then I wanna jump in today uh, because I believe God has a word for us as we close out summer at Hope City, going into the next wave of this year, ending out this year strong, people of faith, come on, people of courage, people of boldness and perseverance. And uh, let's pray and let's jump in. Father, today we have ears to hear you. We have a mind that's positioned and ready to understand. God, most importantly, we have a heart that's ready to receive. God, I pray that all heaviness, anything that's going on in our lives, God, I pray right now that would, would just be lifted off. And if there's anything that's a lid in our lives, if there's any toxic ideology or thinking or anything, God, that's standing in the way of us receiving today, I pray, God, that you would remove it as we position ourselves with expectation, not as spectators, but with expectation in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Come on, you have survived 100% of your worst days. Yeah. Come on, every lie of the enemy that's tried to come against you, Look at the person next to you and say, I'm still standing. Come on, let them know. Say, I'm still standing. It's a big deal. We woke up again today. We're breathing. It's proof that God's not done with us yet. And we're going to talk about the gospel today. And I love the definition of the word gospel. It literally means good news. If you're taking down notes, the title of today's sermon, this weekend's sermon is All or Nothing. All or Nothing. The gospel is really great news. It's filled with hope and joy and, and strength and courage and diligence, and the list goes on and on. And I believe as we end out 2021, we can end out with confidence and audacious faith, expecting the unexpected, not worrying about everything that's happening around us, using wisdom and, and asking God for clarity, absolutely, and being safe, absolutely, but trusting God in the middle of this. I said to my wife last night, I said, you know this, none of this, everything that's happening around us, all of it, none of it catches God off guard. God's not like, what is this Delta variant? Did Delta Airlines bring that here? What? <laughs> what? It doesn't, none of this catches God off guard. So we trust him. I love what Pastor Jeremy says. We trust him even when we can't track him. Because if you read from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see very quickly, y'all, in the end, we win. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to have trials. We're going to have storms. John 16, 33, Jesus himself said, in this life, you're going to have some stuff happen. But take heart. Be of good courage because I've overcome the world. We're going to go through some things. And in the middle of all the other noise that's happening, in the middle of all the bad news, there's really great news, and it's called the gospel. And there are three ways that we can approach life. There's three ways that we can live life. We can live it sinking, where we feel like we just can't get out of a rut. I, I was driving home yesterday, took my family to the beach, and we were driving home, and there was a, a, like a wedding, like on the beach. And I was like, I want to drive over there. And Jackie's like, it's someone else's wedding. I'm like, I know, I just want to get close. And so <laughs> I, I drove out on the beach where I, I didn't have my truck in four-wheel drive, and y'all, I buried it in the sand. And now, now I'm making a lot of noise. And she's like, I think, I think the people in the wedding are noticing. I'm like, well, I'm not going to get stuck here. Like, and so I'm, I'm, I'm putting in four-wheel drive, and I'm turning the wheels. And I was sinking, y'all. And they're like, dearly beloved. And I'm like, you guys win. <laughs> and uh, I finally got it up out of the hill. And we just turned, and we didn't look, and we just drove off. And Jackie's like, we see, we didn't have to go over there. I'm like, you didn't have to go over there. But we wouldn't have stories if we didn't. We need these moments. <laughs> so you can either approach life in three different ways. You can be sinking. You can be just simply surviving, just kind of going through the motions, cruise control, hoping that tomorrow is better than today, or we can approach it with thriving. And I believe, even with everything going on around us, I believe we're still in a thriving season. How many of y'all were part of Serve Day, the Serve Day all across our city? It's amazing how many people were impacted. Our Hope City Missions team is crushing it. Can we give our Hope City Missions team a huge hand? Incredible what God is doing. But I believe we're in a thriving season. God never intended for us to just sink, survive. But he said in John chapter 10, verse 10, yeah, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's all gonna be all kinds of noise around that and chaos around that. But I have come that you would have life and life more abundantly. That kind of life is a thriving Life And as we're the hands and feet of Jesus, as we are set apart, I believe there is a responsibility and an opportunity as we get our yes out of the way to fulfill the heartbeat of heaven through the local church and as individuals here on this earth. Because here's the reality. We're all called to the Great Commission. It is not just for people that have microphones, just for people that hold credentials that are clergy. No, all of us have a mission. All of us have people's lives connected to our destiny. All of us have a call 
and a purpose. And some of you, your job is just a mission, but have you ever thought about it as a mission field? Have you ever thought that maybe you're in that position because God's called you to that position to be salt and light, to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Maybe your neighbors, maybe your family, your job, your community. We're all called to the sphere of influence that God has entrusted us with. But so many times we get so consumed with what's happening in our own lives or what's happening around us, but it's difficult to see the mission field. It's difficult to see the call. I was flying back from Orlando this last week. I was preaching there, did a youth conference there, and I was flying back, and man, I had all kinds of opportunity to share the good news, share the gospel with people at the airport, uh, our waiter at a restaurant, uh, a guy at a shoe store. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but, but I had all kinds of opportunity. If I was so self-consumed about everything else that's worrying me and going on around me, I'll never fulfill the mission field that God has called me to. What's he called you to? Look at the person next to you and say, we're all called. Come on, let them know. This is what Jesus said, Mark 16, verse 15. So this weekend is more of a challenge to our church to be the hands and feet. It's an evangel, kind of an evangelist push to, to go out and be who God's called us to be because here's the reality. People will read your life more than they'll read the Bible. Yeah. Right. Has anybody ever said to you, there's something different about you? There's something that, cha- the atmosphere changes when you walk in. I don't know what it is, but I feel peace when I'm around you. Why do you have so much joy Why do you always seem to smile so much? Why do you seem to have so much confidence and boldness? And it doesn't mean life is perfect, but it means that you recognize that you're set apart. This is what Jesus said, Mark 16 and 15. And then he told them, that's us too. I love this part right here. Go! I woke up somebody. There was a Baptist guy in the back like, dear Lord. This guy's rowdy and is all black and weird shoes. Go into all the world, watch, and preach the good news to a handful of people, to people that you get along with, to people that accept you, to people that recognize you, to people that affirm you. It doesn't say that. It says go into all the world and preach the good news. That's the gospel to everyone. Now, instantly, you're like, all the world? I'm not getting on a plane and flying anywhere. (laughs) Again, mission field, who has God called you to? They say statistically, you have a voice of trust equity in three people in your life, three different people that if you spoke into them, they have ears to hear it. We are all called to go. Number, number one, write that down if you're taking down notes. Number one, we are all called to go. It's a big challenge, a big push. We're all called to go. And whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, there are people's lives attached, again, to our purpose. And the, the faster we get out of our comfort zone, faster we recognize that the comfort zone, nothing ever grows there, it's just comfortable. But when we get out of the comfort zone and we recognize that there is a miracle working God that we can introduce people to, we're gonna begin to see greater things in our lives and others. And the other thing it does is when you pivot and you make this move in order to go, you'll recognize that it unlocks compassion in your life. You'll start recognizing that you recognize other people. You see other people, that you won't be as critical and sarcastic, and you won't judge people based upon the chapter of their life that you walked in on, but instead you'll see them through the filter the way Christ sees them. Well, y'all are overwhelming me with your enthusiasm this morning. It's unbelievable. Like, if you're watching online, this is not a room full of mannequins. These are real people. (laughs) Just, come on, y'all, wake up. Shake it off. Everybody shake it off. Come on. So I love this. (laughs) It's almost too much. I'll be honest. Safety team, okay. I love this acronym of the word GO. It's simple, get out. Get out of your comfort zone. Get get out of your comfort zone and get out into your community. Get out of your comfort zone and get out and serve on our serve days. We make it really easy. I'm grateful for a church that doesn't just have karaoke weekends where we gather together on a Sunday, but we're actually doing some damage to the kingdom of darkness out in our community, man. We're reaching a bunch of people. Get out and serve. Get out of the flesh and walk in the spirit. Because here's the reality. When you walk with Jesus, the residue of your relationship with Jesus speaks for itself. And God is not looking for perfect people or no one could be used. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for purposed people. 
Every one of us, from the moment of conception, the moment he knit you together in your mama's womb, whether you had a rough upbringing or you had a perfect, squeaky clean, all Christian sort of family, or you were like me, born an accident and almost aborted twice, from the moment of conception, it says that he is faithful to complete the work that he started in your life. Every one of us have a purpose. Come on, say it out loud, I have a purpose. And you may be like, Daniel, you don't understand, my past is so messy. I got great news, your past was an education, not a destination. And he does not call the qualified, God qualifies the called. I love what Pastor Jeremy says, he said, you're just one mention of his name away from his presence being right there again. Just one mention. So he doesn't position and look around and say, she's perfect and he's got it all together and his account, bank account looks great and she hasn't sworn in three days. It's Houston traffic, y'all. Everybody's out here cussing. Y'all got to be careful. It's wild out here in these streets. But when you recognize that he doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called, you'll recognize that all you have to do is get in the way of someone's storm. The Bible says this in Romans 10, verse 14 and 15. This is one of my favorite verses. This is an anthem that I have been living out the past 18, 20 years of ministry. It says this, but how can they call on him? That's, that's, that's the Lord. We're talking about Jesus. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And, and how will anyone go, there's that word again, and tell them without being sent this is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. How can anyone go if they haven't been sent? That's why we create so many opportunities here at Hope City. You go through the growth track, you join the dream team. That's why we want you to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose and make a difference. Because when you position yourself in a position that says, all right, God, you increase, I'll decrease, I'll get my yes out of the way. Now God, send me. Send me into the community. Let me be a part of something that's bigger than my self. Sure, it's easier to just sleep in on a Saturday, but I'm telling you, if you show up and put on one of your serve shirts and jump in and be a part of what God's doing with Hope City Missions, it will mark you. It will change your life, and you'll see that it's making a massive difference. Now, at the end there, it says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Some of you are like, you see, I'm, all, I'm already disqualified. i got super ugly feet. Some of y'all need to stop wearing, you got the toes all hanging out, the little pinky toe. Catches on little kids and knocks them down. And you paint it and put a bedazzle bead on it. It's weird. Like, just close them up. <laughs> all right. But the reality is, we have to be stronger than our strongest excuse. Because it's really easy to say, ah, not right now. Ah, I'll do it when I have more time. I'll do it when I have more money. I'll sow into that project when things are a little bit better for me. You have to be stronger than your strongest excuse. Because when you give God a little bit of faith, that mustard seed moment, God, I'll say yes. God, I'll, I'll even position myself and make a pledge towards the silos and believe with audacious faith that God's gonna show up and come through so that I can fulfill that pledge. The moment you take that step, God will direct your steps and he will lead you to what's next. And here's the reality. You don't have to have perfect oratory, perfect delivery and eloquent speech. Paul himself said, hey, it's not with my enticing words of man's wisdom. Like he wasn't a poet, he wasn't walking in there just perfect, no, no, he said it's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this quote, preach the gospel, the good news, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. I went to, uh, I'm kind of a sneakerhead. some of you have no idea what that means, you can Google it, uh, love shoes, and so uh, I was just preaching at this conference in Orlando, and this guy's like, hey bro, this is kind of this, like low key, like there's not even a sign on the on the building, like it's almost a scavenger hunt to like find this place. You may not want to go, but they've got some like super exclusive shoes. I was like, don't threaten me with a good time. Why are we not already driving there? Like it's, it's a scavenger hunt. We're going to be certain. Like it took a while. Like, like the, it's weird. They do pop-up shops and stuff like that. So we ended up showing up and man, it was like when they, when they opened the doors, it was like, ah! like it's like, are those baby angels singing? What's happening right now? And there's this guy sitting over on a stool and he's literally like lacing up shoes and there's no prices on anything. So you're like, hey bro, how much are these? He's like, those, 400. I was like, okay, okay, okay. 
And then, and then I would, 10 minutes later, I'd pick him back up again. I was like, how much of these? He's like, those 380. I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask you again in 10 more minutes because the... <laughs> I just pray, he just makes up prices as we were going. But so, so I was there, and so he starts making small talk, and he starts talking about uh, uh, like, like life, and man, y'all have some pretty cool drip, and you got some nice shoes, and what do you do for a living? And this is always that caveat. This is always that, like, well, I'm a pastor. I can marry and bury people. Like, <laughs> like, it gets weird, and I'm always carrying a massive, extra large King James Version of the Bible. So I can hit people with it. Um, no, and I said, uh, actually, man, I'm from Houston, and uh, uh, I, I work for a nonprofit. I was just waiting. I was just waiting for a minute. I was just waiting. Because I could tell he was on edge already. And his, my friend who I'm with goes, oh, he's a pastor. And instantly, instantly, he shut down. He wanted his son to come help me. You could tell this brother had church hurt. You could tell that Christians have rubbed him wrong. And throughout the rest of this moment, we were navigating like just kind of tough waters. And so uh, I left. The next day, I was like, man, I want to go back. I went back. And I was hanging out in the store again, looking at those shoes. And he's like, so you're a Christian, huh? And I said, I am. And this day, I, I was wearing a shirt that said Godweiser instead of Budweiser. So like, he could tell. He's like, see your shirt. You could tell that you're a Christian. I wasn't really. And he goes, man, you were really kind. You were really kind yesterday. He's like, bro, every Christian I've dealt with are a bunch of hypocrites. And instantly he dives in. Man, I don't go to church. I got... And he starts just telling me his story. And, and within a few moments, I realized I didn't come here to look at shoes. I came here to get in the way of this guy's storm. And I've learned something in the process of loving people. It's really easy to... The whole front row is like, I'm in the splash zone. Like, <laughs> so be careful. It's really easy to tell somebody you love them and be like, yeah, man, God loves you. And just be really flippant with your words or say, hey, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be praying for you. I hate that you've been hurt. I, I hate that you've been, I hate that somebody's done you wrong. I, I hate that you've labeled all Christians as this. And I, I hope it gets better. And we're almost flippant with our words. We almost just kind of throw them out there. But I realize I'm on an assignment. Yeah, I went and picked up some shoes. Trust me. Praise, <laughs> praise the Lord. And I apologize to my wife later. But I realize, God, you sent me here on an assignment to get in the way of this guy's storm and redirect him back to you. Redirect him back to the heart of a compassionate, unfailing, unconditional, loving God who when other people have hurt him and other churches have hurt him, I could have just been like, man, I hope somebody sends somebody towards his path to help. I hope somebody loves him the right way one day. I hope somebody prays for him. And I said, hey man, I want to prove to you that there are Christians and there are followers of Christ that aren't labeled by everything that you just said. And within a few moments, I'm praying for him. I'm praying for his business. I'm praying for favor. I'm praying that God would put stitches where there's been band-aids. And I didn't just flippantly say, I love you. I didn't flippantly say, I'll pray for you. I actually prayed for him. I actually got in the way of his storm. What if we actually followed through? Have you ever talked to somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm struggling with cancer. And you're like, man, it's terrible. I'll be praying for you. What if you actually prayed for him? What if you actually laid hands on them and trusted that God will show up and heal and reverse that diagnosis, or you're talking to somebody that's struggling financially, and you're like, man, I didn't know you were going through all that. I'll, be, I'll, be, uh, I'll send some vibes your way. We don't need vibes, y'all. Start praying for people and leaning in and being the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm preaching bolder than y'all are responding. I'm telling you. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. This is what Matthew says Chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. You've heard this verse. We, pre we preach it all the time. It says this. You're the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on. Verse 14. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. I love where this shifts. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Glorify your Father in heaven. See, I walked in there looking for shoes, but I'm also carrying a light. I walked in there looking for shoes, but I'm also carrying a residue of hope and of peace and of life. I walked in there looking for shoes, but I also walked in with healing in my hands. And I trusted that even though I might not say everything 
I may not present everything perfectly in that moment. I trust the Holy Spirit in me and through me to say what needed to be said to point him back to Jesus. Salt and light. This verse is unpacking where the salt of the earth, literally Jesus in this parable saying, your life is distinctive. You were never called to just blend in. You were never called to just blend in the pack where you, you, we can't differentiate you from someone that's not a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be weird about it. You don't have to carry a bottle of anointing oil around all the time. Like, I'm gonna pray for her, slap her in the mouth. Like, you don't, like it's super weird. If you do that, tell them you go to another church. Like, <laughs> name another. I was, uh, I was, we were living in Michigan uh, for a season, and uh, I'm from Ohio, so I don't ever say that publicly because it's kind of a conflict of interest, Michigan to Ohio. And if you're from Michigan, God bless you. Um, <laughs> But we were up there, and there was a, a, a rancher who had all these horses, and he had all these horses, and they were all running around, and one day we went out, and we were like, this is so cool. And I was like, what, what is that? There was another horse out there running around, uh, looking like, playing like, galloping like a horse, but he looked different. He had stripes. And I remember my son was like, look at that striped horse. And I'm like, that's a Zorse. It was like a... <laughs> Wait a minute. No, he had raised up a zebra as a tiny little baby all the way up, and he ended up jumping in and acting like all of them. There was something distinctively different between him and the horses. It was his stripes. He stood out. He could never blend in. And it's the same way as believers. It's the same way as sons and daughters. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. We live in this world and in this life, this mission, this jobs, and what we do but we look different, we sound different, we speak different, we breathe different. Because Paul said, it's not I who lives any longer, but Christ who lives and dwells in me. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and I'll give you an opportunity at the end. But the reality is, once you give your life to the Lord, you recognize God knows me, God chose me, God loves me. But in our humanity, we think about our inadequacies, our insecurities, our doubts, and our fears. Instead, we have to filter them through God's faithfulness. We have to look at, it, we have to look at our lives through the filter of God's, uh, God's goodness and God's power and God's love. So number one, we're all called to go. Number two, write this down, we are all called to love. That guy was pretty rude, I'll be honest. First 15 minutes in the store wasn't a great experience. First impression wasn't awesome. But we're all called to love. I, I was sent there on an assignment to get in the way of his storm, recognizing that I may be the only Bible, I said this a moment ago, that he'll ever read. I may be the only Christ-like that he, he'll ever see. What if he would have written off every Christian and, and fully given up on the church if we would have handled him rude and handled him dismissive like everybody else? And I'm not saying I'm doing everything perfect. I do think this Chuck off-white combo in the black is a decent... <laughs> I think that that's good. That was a good choice. Okay. We're all called to love. And I'm not talking about romantic love. We're going to talk about that in two weeks during strings attached. We're talking about agape love. We're talking about a God kind of love. And it's easy to talk about and say it, but here's the reality. Walking in love is an action. It's a choice to choose to love others. And it's tough. I put it on my Instagram the other day. Like, y'all are worried about getting likes and you don't even like everybody. <laughs> and the truth is, like, it's easy to say, I love you, bro. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm good, man. Yeah, 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 we're cool, we're cool. I love you, bro. But the truth is, can we lay down frustrations? Can we lay down disagreements? Can we lay down other mindsets and say, I'm gonna choose to love? I'm gonna choose to walk in love? I'm gonna choose to look at people through the filter of unconditional Agape love, because here's what the Bible says. Again, not my opinion. The Bible says in John 13, verse 34 and 35, and I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I love you, and your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Mark 12, 30 and 31 says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said this, no other commandment is greater than these. Our love for God and from God requires us and should compel us to love our neighbor. 
But you have to receive this love first because it's difficult to love someone out of an empty place yourself. So when he's saying love your neighbor as yourself, he's literally saying receive that love first and then out of the overflow of the love that you've received, you love others. Because again, what fills, spills. So in order to love others, you gotta look in the mirror and be comfortable in your own skin. You gotta look in the mirror and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Embrace who you are and whose you are. Separate all the frustrations. Lay down the insecurities. Lay down those things. And I know, it, but Daniel, that's easier said than done. The more you lean into his presence, I'm telling you, he'll heal and fix and restore all these areas of inadequacies and insecurities that you feel like you walk in. The truth is we have to love others. It's important to get healed through the power of God's presence from what hurt you because the reality is, and we say this all the time, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you because an unhealed heart often becomes an unleashed hurt on others. But when there's this agape, unconditional love in your life and the Heavenly Father is working on softening your heart, God will begin to stir a fresh wind. He'll, he'll begin to stir a, a, a new beginning. He'll begin to stir a new joy and expectation in your life. I wanna pray for you. Watch you online in this room at our other locations. Close your eyes just for a moment. God, I pray today that past hurts and struggles. I pray, God, that today that anybody who's walking in a, in a position, God, where they feel like it's difficult to love others, maybe they are having a tough time loving themselves. Maybe they're having a tough time receiving that love from you. Maybe there's been a lid on their life because they've had a tough time forgiving someone. It doesn't mean they have to forget it or even go around that person, but forgiving them, releasing it and putting it in your hands. I've said this before, but God, I pray today that when someone forgives this person, that will never say sorry, God, I pray today, God, that it will unlock healing in their life, healing in their marriage, healing in their future life with their family, future marriage, future kids. God, I pray today, Lord, that you're healing power, God, will we'll put stitches where there's been Band-Aids. And God, I pray today that they would receive that love, that unconditional agape love that says, I'm not mad at you, but I'm madly in love with you. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Colossians 3, verse 17, one of my favorite verses. I believe this is what our church looks like. I believe Hope City, we're hope to a city. It says this, in whatever you do or say, you do it as a representative of the Lord. But that's heavy. Like we can read that and dismiss it and get past it quick, but I don't care. No, pop it back up. Put it back up real quick. Whatever you do or say, I want you to read this. Do it as a representative. That means when you walk in, people don't see Daniel. They see Christ-like. So it's a choice in free will to look Christ-like. It's a choice within free will to laugh at the joke you know you shouldn't have laughed at, to, to, to entertain conversations and yeah, but you don't understand the, the people I run around with, man. I, if I don't hang, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be cool with me. No, no, no. We're, th this does not say in whatever you do or say, you do it as a representative unless you work with ex this people, these type of misfits, this type of. No, no, it says whatever you do or say, you do it as a representative. I'm mindful of this all the time. I I'm mindful of it. I'm mindful of it when I travel. I'm mindful of it. I try to be mindful of it when I drive. I'm really mindful of it when I'm around my kids because they magnify and they copy everything we do. I'm mindful of it and how I'm communicating with people because everything I do and say, we're supposed to do it as a representative of Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So we're called to go, we're called to love, and last but not least, number three, we are called to be the church. Look at the person next to you and say there's safety in the pack. I don't watch these very often, but I was in my hotel and I was flipping through and the animal planet. They had like, they were talking about like wolves and like different animal groups that have like packs and they stay connected in the pack. And it was really fascinating. I'm like, this is amazing. Like the way they did it, the way they, the way they led, the way they lived, it was really impressive. But they stumbled upon this group of gazelle and gazelle, gazelles were all over the map. Like they were like, hey, you and me, we're not with you. Like there was no pack. Like they were just all over the map. And these lions begin to stalk this group of gazelle and they noticed this one gazelle that was staying outside of their pack. They were, he wasn't staying with inside of the pack. And he was getting a little too confident, a little too cocky, just trying to do his own thing. And the lions, this pack, they begin to stalk these gazelles for days, 
Finally, they noticed that this little gazelle decided to get away from the pack. Like, I'm good. I don't need the local church. I don't need a connect group. I don't need accountability. I don't need anybody telling me what I need to do. I don't need anybody to say, I could figure it out on my own. I got Google. <laughs> Every time I post something, I get at least 11 likes. <laughs> Now, he ended up getting away from the safety of his pack, even though it was unorganized. And the enemy, this pack of lions, decided to attack. Y'all, there's safety in the pack. There's longevity in the local church. There's a reason why we're better together. There's, there's a reason why if you want to go somewhere fast, go alone. If you want to go somewhere far, go together. There's a reason why life moves at the speed of relationships. There's, an, there's a reason why iron sharpens iron. There's a reason why we have summer connect groups to keep us connected. There's a reason why isolation and lockdowns and hiding out is difficult in our psyche and in our humanity because we're made to live in community. We're made to do life together. We were called to be the church, not to attend a church, but to be a part of the Big C Church. This is who we are. Going, loving, representing the heart of God. And I recognized in the, watching this animal planet, like, man, how many people, they say the average church attender that calls a local church home, like, this is my church, this is where I go. Pastor Jeremy's my pastor. I love this church. The average church attender in America, they say, goes 1.5 times a month. COVID's messed with all of that. They say the average church attender, the one that would say they're a Christian and they're on fire for God, reads their Bible around 13 minutes a month, prays around 21 minutes a month. Y'all, there is safety in the pack. I've seen it in our own lives. I've seen it in our own connect group. I've seen it in the intricacies of every area of our church. How many of y'all have been a part of a freedom group before? How many of you guys have been changed because of what God did in that freedom group? And I'm grateful for a church. I'm grateful for pastors that say, let's set up every opportunity. Let's put everybody in a position and give them opportunity to grow. Again, God's not a forcer. We can't force you to join the dream team. We can't force you to go through growth track. We can't force you to serve. But what God is, is he's a filler. Every time you make room, he'll fill. You want more compassion? Make room. You want to be used by God and be the hands and feet of Jesus? Make room. You want to see healing in your hands? Make room. You want to see God work through your life? Make room. Y'all can stand your feet as we bring this in for a landing. Here's reality. Look at me real quick, because this is tough. Sometimes it gets overwhelming. Like, what am I supposed to do? Here's the reality. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And this is a push for you to go through growth track. This is a push that if you've been sitting on the sidelines wondering if there's room for you, the resounding answer is yes. This is a push for you to be a part of a connect group or next semester lead a connect group. Go through growth track. Be a part of the family. And if you're church hopping and church shopping wondering if this fits, welcome home. This is a place where you can get your roots down deep. Be a part of our online campus wherever you're at in the world. But this is a place where you can serve, sow, be filled up. And we're a church of faith, y'all. We're a church that believes for signs, wonders, and miracles. We're a church that's contending for greater things. We're a church that wants to see lives restored, marriages helped, addictions break off, things that were falling apart fall into place. That's who we are. We have to recognize that we are the church. This is what the Bible says in Romans 12, verse four and six. It says this, in this way, we are all like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. That's us, say I'm chosen. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of the body, but as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we don't, we don't mount so much. So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, this part right here, I love it. It says, let's just go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other, trying to be something we aren't. There is room for you. There is room for you and your gift and the assignment and the call of God on your life. Your next step is growth track. Your next step is to join the dream team. Who serves on our dream team? Wave at me. Look, look at everybody in the room. This is what family looks like. Multi-generational, multicultural. This is what church like heaven looks like. 
So lift your hands towards heaven. Father, today I pray that we would receive this challenge and recognize that we're called to go. We are all called to go. The mission of our jobs, the mission of where you've uh, uh, allowed us to have access to people's lives. God, we're called to go. This mission, this job is a mission field. God, place healing in our hands today. Lead us across somebody's path. Let us speak faith where there's so much fear right now. Let us speak faith where there's all kinds of noise with the news and all kinds of news surrounding us on social media, all kinds of negativity surrounding us. God, let us be people of faith that recognizes that we have the answer and your name is Jesus. That we have hope and hope has a name and his name is Jesus. God, I pray today that we would receive the assignment to go. We would receive the assignment to love this unconditional agape love, and we'll stop judging people based upon the chapter of their lives that we walked in on. We'll stop judging people, and we'll start looking at them through the filter of faith. And last but not least, God, we know that we are called to be the church. So God, I pray that we have people that are activated, activating their assignment, activating their purpose by going through the growth track, by jumping in and being a part, truly knowing you, truly finding freedom, truly discovering their purpose so, God, they can make a difference and step into who you've called them to be as sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, you can put your hands down at all of our campuses watching online if you're here today and you say, Daniel, here's the truth. I'm not going, I'm not loving, and I'm not the church because I don't know Jesus. We say this all the time. The answer begins with and ends with Jesus. The foundation of everything we do here is Jesus. The way, the truth, the life. The way to heaven, the way to the Father is through Jesus. So if you're here today and you say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but something has been stirring me this whole day that says I need to, or maybe you got caught up in the prodigal life and you fell away, and you got caught up in just living for yourself and you've chosen yourself, and you say, today I wanna to rededicate and I wanna surrender my life to God. Every eye closed. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will walk you through that. If you're watching at one of our other campuses, if you're here at West Houston, I'm gonna count to three. We will not embarrass you. It's God's job to change you, but it is our job to walk with you so that you can be discipled. One, Daniel, I wanna give my life to God. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand if you wanna know him. Two, today I wanna to rededicate my life. Today I wanna to make things right. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hands going up everywhere. You can put your hands down. Anybody else, wave at me today. You're talking about me. Again, say yes to Jesus in the chat. Yes, our team is looking at our other campuses. If you're here one more time, just wave at me. Daniel, you're talking about me. I wanna give my life to Jesus today. Today's my day from the front to the back. Okay, if everybody would pray this prayer, come on everybody, including our Hope City team, everybody on our team, say this out loud. Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins and all of my struggles. I lay them at your feet. You have been so good to me. And from this moment on, I choose to live for you. You're my Father. You're my Savior, and you're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God a shout of praise?